Good evening. Welcome and thank you for joining us on this rainy evening. Tonight we are very honored to host the Honorable Alex Kaczynski, Chief Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and Eugene Volick, Gary T. Schwartz, Professor of Law, UCLA School of Law, and founder and co-author of the Volick Conspiracy. Our distinguished speakers will discuss threats to our First Amendment, specifically freedom of speech, but in questions you, we can broaden that. There is no other nation in the world with the First Amendment. It mandates our freedoms of speech, worship, press, assembly, and petition. There are forces that are attacking the First Amendment, however, in ways both obvious and subtle. Freedom of expression is a cornerstone of democratic rights and freedoms and is essential in enabling democracy to work and public participation in decision making. Citizens cannot exercise their right to vote effectively or take part in public decision making if they do not have free access to information and ideas and are not able to express their views freely. Freedom of expression is thus not only important for individual dignity but also to participation, accountability, and democracy. Violations of freedom of expression often go hand in hand with other violations, in particular the right to freedom of association and assembly. A short background on our speakers. Judge Alex Kaczynski was appointed chief judge at the newly formed United States Court of, of Federal Claims in 1982. In 1985, at the age of 35, Kaczynski, Judge Kaczynski was appointed to a new seat at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit by President Reagan, making him the youngest federal appeals judge and became chief judge on November 30, 2007. He graduated from UCLA, receiving an A.B. degree in 1972 and from UCLA Law School, receiving a J.D. in 1975. Judge Kaczynski is the son of two Holocaust survivors from Romania. Sabine, his mother, spent the war in a Romanian ghetto. Moses, his father, was held for four years in the Transnistria concentration camp with about 150,000 other Jews. In 1962, when he was 12, his parents brought him to the United States. The family settled in the Los Feliz neighborhood of Los Angeles, California, where his father, Moses, ran a small grocery store. Judge Kaczynski is married to Marcy Jane Tiffany and has three children, Yale, Wyatt, and Clayton, two grandsons, Quinn and Owen, and a new granddaughter recently born. Eugene Volick teaches free speech law, criminal law, tort law, religious freedom law, and church-state relations law at UCLA School of Law, where he has often taught copyright law and a seminar and ran a seminar on firearms regulation policy. Before coming to UCLA, he clerked for, just, for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor on the U.S. Supreme Court and for Judge Alex Kaczynski on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Professor Volick is the author of several legal textbooks, as well as over 70 law review articles and over 80 op-eds. He is a member of the American Law Institute, a member of the American Heritage Dictionary Usage Panel, and the founder and co-author of the Volick Conspiracy, a weblog that gets about 20,000 visits per weekday. He graduated from UCLA with a BS in Math Computer Science at age 15 and has written many articles on computer software. Eugene Volek was born in the USSR. His family immigrated to the US when he was seven years old. Judge Kaczynski and Professor Volek will take your questions following their discussion. You can have, write your, dis, uh, your questions on the cards that we have and we will pick them up whenever you're ready. At this time, please turn off your cell phone and your electronic devices, and it is with great honor that I now introduce you to Judge Alex Kaczynski and Professor Eugene Volek. Uh, Professor, so I want to start by putting something out there, and then Judge, uh, you tell me what you think about it. All right. So I want to say that uh, free speech uh, in America today is uh, basically at its high watermark in American history, which probably means in world history. Let me begin by legal protections. Uh, people rightly worry about this or that kind of restriction that either ones that are springing up or some that have been around for a long time. It's good that we worry about such things. It helps keep, keep them at bay. But if you look at the big picture of constitutional protection, 
that's offered uh, free speech, here's more or less the pattern. Uh, around the time the First Amendment was, was crafted, it wasn't at all clear even that it uh, provided much protection against criminal punishment for speech. It was pretty clear it provided protection against licensing schemes where you had to get a license in order to publish a newspaper, let's say, and the government could deny it to you, or injunctions in which you were ordered not to say something. But if you were prosecuted for, say, seditious libel, criticism of the government, it wasn't even at all clear that the First Amendment prevented that. And it certainly didn't prevent state restrictions, such things, because the First Amendment, as written, starts with Congress shall make no law, so only applied to federal law. Uh, and indeed, while American uh, f uh, speech and um, the, uh, the output of the press in America was very free compared to everywhere in the rest of the world, was much more at least potentially legally constrained uh, than it was today. Uh, and in terms of uh, judicial protection for speech, that was something that was just in its embryonic phases. The, the same pattern happened throughout the 1800s. A good deal of free speech and more protection uh, from the legal process than there was uh, in much of the rest of the world, but still much less than now. I'll give you an example, a little, little known example. In the, uh, in the first decade of the 1900s, uh, the, somebody was prosecuted in Washington State for publishing a biographical sketch of George Washington in which George Washington was portrayed as a drunkard. He was prosecuted for libel, libeling the dead. Now, Washington at that point was over 100 years dead. Even his family wasn't really around to uh, threaten to punch the author in the face or whatever the justification may have been, but no, state law prohibited blackening the memory of the dead, and unsurprisingly, uh, uh, saying something bad about a revered national hero was something that was particularly likely to draw the prosecutor's ire. Today there are questions about how academic freedom on campus and how free do professors feel. Well. Up until the 1950s, it wasn't at all clear that professors, even at public universities, had any First Amendment rights when it came to firing. The theory at the time was that uh, they had the right to speak, but they didn't have the right to be professors. And they could be fired for any reason the government might choose. Uh, so uh, starting with the 1930s, the Supreme Court started really fairly aggressively enforcing free speech and free press protections. That increased pretty steadily up until the 1970s. Starting with the 1970s, there was some retrenchment in certain areas. For example, government employee speech rights are somewhat less now than they were, say, 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, it's a little easier for the government to fire employees based on their speech. Student free speech rights, which in K through 12 schools, which were basically not thought to exist at all until the 1940s, are probably somewhat more constrainable now than they were, say, some 40 years ago. Uh, so there's some areas where there's been some back and forth, but in other areas there's been still more protection. More protection for speech having to do with campaigns, uh, even speech that costs money having to do with campaigns. That was the Citizens United case is one of the ones that secured such extra protection. Um, uh, more protection for religious speech in public fora. There was some dispute as to whether the government could exclude religious speech from certain kinds of government-run programs, and the court said, no, it can't, because religious speech is just as protected as other kinds of speech. Uh, more protection uh, in just basically a very wide variety of areas. More protection, for example, for commercial advertising, which was considered completely unprotected until, uh, until the 1970s. Or, um, so uh, uh, basically, if it comes to the law, we are at pretty much the high watermark of free speech protection. Now, when it comes to practice, in terms of not just what the law allows, but what society allows and what technology allows and what the business world allows, the answer is we have more free speech than ever before. Uh, Forty years ago, uh, the regime was something that uh, uh, press critic A.J. Liebling described as freedom of the press belongs to him who owns one. Uh, and if you wanted to speak to a large group of people, either you had to have a lot of money so you could buy lots of ads, or a newspaper for that matter, buy a newspaper, or you had to be saying things that, the, uh, that newspapers and television stations wanted to rebroadcast. Now, you can start a blog. Now, not everybody will read your blog. In fact, pretty much nobody will read your blog at first. But if you have something interesting to say, you could get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of readers potentially. Uh, and lots of people do. Of course, there are lots of junk blogs out there, just like there have been lots of junk everything. 
lots of junk books out. There are probably more junk blogs because they're so much cheaper to produce, but you don't have to read the junk blogs. You can read the really interesting ones run by people who are really experts in the field, uh, either expressing their opinions or reporting on the facts or whatever else. Uh, so from the speaker's perspective, uh, it's easier than ever to speak and there's more and more diversity of thought out there. Even if you're talking about mainstream media, it's more diverse than ever before, at least in the number of outlets, but also probably the political makeup of the outlets before. It used to be in many places, it was pretty much was a pretty solid liberal group. Not so much now. Uh, and, uh, uh, and from the listener's perspective, you have access to all these things, and they're free. You don't even have to pay for them. How much better can you get? Now, as I said, there's a lot of dreck. There's a lot, there's, uh, Theodore Sturgeon, who was a science fiction writer, had would coined what was called Sturgeon's Law. I think a lot of people were, st were telling him, oh, science fiction. There's so much dreck in science fiction. He said 90% of everything is dreck. Uh, he may not have used the word dreck. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that's true on the internet. That's true, you know, it's not just on the internet. It's probably true of newspapers out there too. A lot of drecky newspapers. But, if you, uh, but it's not that hard to find the good stuff in between. Uh, so there are threats, there's no doubt there are threats, I'm sure we're going to talk about it, but my claim is uh, we should be pretty happy that we've got more both legal protection for free speech and more actual substantive free speech out there than ever before, and I think that's good. What do you think? <laughs> I agree. All right! Um, actually, um, what Eugene says, I mean, there's, there's much truth to it, in fact, uh, Everything you said is true. I'm not sure it's the entire truth, but it, it is certainly true. I, um, I communicate with judges um, all over the world. I'm on this listserv with judges from uh, uh, England and Canada and Australia and New Zealand, uh, you know, just judges from several uh, dozen uh, countries. And uh, there is, uh, uh yeah, there we go. How about this? And. Um, uh, and many of these are countries with a tradition of freedom like, like our own, uh, you know, Canada, England. Uh, um, uh, and uh, the one way in which you are really quite different from any place else in the world, much more different than in, in, in many other areas of the law, much more different than we are in terms of criminal procedure or um, um, uh, other kinds of regulation. Uh, the, the one way that is truly distinguishes uh, the American system is the um, degree of protection that we give speech. And the idea that we have a constitutional protection for speech, that, uh, the, that there are things that the legislature in its wisdom cannot prohibit, uh, cannot prohibit, uh, just astonishes uh, many of my colleagues from even you know civil rights places like Canada. I mean, very close by places. It, it astonishes them and amuses them. Now, this is not to say that they favor oppression and that uh, their governments would ban many uh, things that we would uh, that 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 uh, uh, people would want to do. They in fact have. Uh, governments that do not engage in censorship uh, very widely, but the idea that you can't, or the government can't do it, uh, is really something that, that uh, they find uh, quite different, quite astonishing in, in, in ways that they don't find astonishing uh, many other ways uh, in which we run our legal system. So, so, so this, this much um, is certainly true. Uh, I was looking, I, I need a crib sheet, unlike the professor, I actually have to uh, uh, look, so I was looking at the Supreme Court cases for the last uh, several years going back to uh, Citizens United and um, um, I, I didn't do a precise count but it looks to me like of a dozen cases or so there may be one or two where they upheld, uh, Supreme Court upheld speech restrictions and uh, in every other case they, they struck them down. One after another, things that are truly surprising, things that you would uh, almost sort of stick in your throat like uh, the right to uh, um, to protest a funeral uh, when it's offensive to the families, you know, the Stevens case. Or uh, we have a constitutional right to engage in crush videos, videos of having small animals um, tortured or, uh, or killed. Um, that there is a constitutional right to that. Uh, there's a constitutional right um, to, um, to uh, uh, video games, to, to have children play video games uh, without government restriction, no matter how violent or sexual or um, the, the government may not, under the First Amendment, um, um, uh, prohibit 
uh, their distribution of, of those kinds of materials. And uh, though I just mentioned three cases that uh, I must say I, I was in a sense happy about the result. I was happy the first amendment prevailed, but that I personally found the outcome a little bit shocking and, uh, and, and, and somewhat troubling. Uh, so uh, I think uh, what Eugene says uh, about government restriction from speech uh, is, is certainly right. I'm not so sure about the practice, and in some ways the practice may be more important ultimately than, than, um, than um, the uh, than what the government can do. And in many ways, um, the internet has opened up new vistas, and uh, Eugene is right, uh, you, you, can, uh, you can now publish anything in a sense, you can put it out there and potentially have it be read by somebody. Uh, but technology has also created some real um, issues, some real uh, difficulties uh, when it comes to the First Amendment, and uh, I'll just mention a couple. Uh, one of them is um, newspapers are dying, um, and that, um, um, the, the, uh, they, they are holding on to a tenuous existence, and I, I, uh, they, they've been killed by basically two things. They've been killed by the internet blogs, and they've been killed by Craigslist, the money they used to make in, uh, in advertising, uh, in um, what, what, classi classified advertising which was the backbone of uh, much of, the, uh, of, the, um, uh, of their finances, is now gone. Who, who would advertise in a newspaper when it appears a few days from now and nobody reads when you can post it on Craigslist with photographs and uh, uh, for nothing? Um, and um, in addition to that, um, news, uh, getting the news uh, from uh, remote places is an expensive proposition. If we have a war zone, if we have, uh, uh, if we have uh, news developing in remote parts of the world, sending correspondents there, professional news teams to get at the truth is, is expensive. You put them online, they get snapped up, they get replicated by blogs, they get replicated by, uh, by um, uh, secondary sites, which then are the ones that get read and uh, the, the newspapers and other news organizations have a difficult time, have had a difficult time uh, coming up with a model for um, um, making a living, making a, making, uh, being able to uh, make a profit uh, providing the news. And in a sense that cheapens the, the, the uh, or that, that uh, it, it, in a sense it is true that having more voices uh, is, uh, is a good thing because uh, you have more points of view and people can make informed choices. But there's some point when it becomes difficult to tell uh, when voices are reliable, when voices are, uh, uh, have, uh, uh, have a legitimate point of view, uh, and when they're just making things up. If you have a newspaper, if you have, uh, uh, if you have um, uh, a, a broadcast station, uh, if you commit a libel, you, you, you can get sued. Now, suing for libel is difficult, but at least it provides some sort of constraint. If you are a blogger with a laptop, uh, you can say anything about anybody. Uh, you can uh, Photoshop a picture of them uh, having uh, sex with a donkey and uh, put it online. And if they come after you, what are they going to get? They're going to get you a Mac and, uh, and nothing else. Uh, and so there's no... Uh, in the meantime, if you are the target of somebody's uh, um, uh, blog, uh, I don't mean pick on blog, people who post online, um, uh, um, uh, either on blog or on Facebook or tweet or uh, do these things, uh, um, the, the, the damage uh, to, to you personally and sometimes the damage to, to greater interests uh, uh, is uh, um, immediate and the relief you can get in the courts is, is, uh, is uh, limited. Um, you will recall, some of you will recall, the Pentagon Papers case of uh, uh, 68? Close to the 68? Uh, 71. 71, same. Remember what happened is that uh, uh, um, uh, um, Ellsberg released uh, the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times. The New York Times 
published it in installments, and it issued the first installment. After the first installment came out, the Justice Department went to court and got an injunction, and the presses stopped. Now, they didn't stop for very long. The, 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 the process went on for uh, an incredibly short time. There was, from the time the injunction was issued to the time that the Supreme Court ruled was something like two weeks. It was a very short peri period of time. But at least there was a ruling by the, by the courts and eventually by the Supreme Court that said, yes, this is protected by the First Amendment. And while the courts thought about the issue, while the parties had a chance to litigate, while the government came in and made a case as to why this ought to be, uh, uh, ought to be um, uh, stopped, why the, why the publication ought to be stopped, uh, nothing happened. The, the, the press has stopped and the public did not find out. Now, people think that's censorship, but sometimes when you're dealing with men in the field who are being shot at, military secrets, maybe the ability to enter an injunction and stop things long enough for us to think about is, 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 is maybe not such a bad thing. Eventually, the Supreme Court said it's protected by the First Amendment, and then the press has rolled. Seven years later, uh, a publication in Wisconsin called The Progressive uh, was about to publish an article about how to build your own atom bomb. A, the government went to court, it got an injunction, and the press has stopped. And the case was litigated for weeks, and eventually uh, uh, the, uh, the, the court allowed the publication to go forward. But there was a chance to think about it, there was a chance to, th uh, to consider the matter. Today, it's not possible. As you saw with WikiLeaks, uh, uh, again, I, I haven't read all those materials, but it doesn't matter what it is. It gets online, and at that point, it becomes public and can never be took back. It can never be stopped. And I think that's a danger, because you know the First Amendment, as strong as there's a protection of speech, part of the way the protection of speech works is through a balance. The idea that you have many voices, uh, and one voice will not drown out or, uh, all the others. Uh, you, cannot, uh, you can have much freedom from government regulation, but when it comes to essential interests like national security, there will be the ability to make a reasoned judgment. That is gone. That is now no longer possible. Anybody who gets anything like uh, uh, Dr. Ellsberg uh, got, those, uh, the Pentagon Papers, wouldn't bother going to the New York Times that has to go through a printing process, uh, he would uh, deliver them to, uh, uh, to WikiLeaks or some such uh, website, and they would be online, and uh, there would be nothing we could do about it. So I think that is one danger. The danger of disappearing uh, reliable news sources is another danger. I think another um, danger is the fact that um, you, it is very hard to validate anything on the internet. Uh, it is very difficult to tell uh, reliable from unreliable. Remember the days when Walter Cronkite used to get on the tube and you'd look at him and uh, he just exuded, uh, uh, he just exuded uh, professionalism and, uh, and, um, and um, reliability. Now maybe I was fooled, but if Walter said it, I thought it was the gospel truth. And there was a pretty good chance I was right. Cause, uh, and nowadays, uh, it is very difficult to tell, and uh, we, uh, we have the phenomenon of people watching more and more news sources, I won't mention any names, that really wind up being uh, vehicles for political points of view, and that uh, actually are not, are not there to convey news so much as it is to use news or to use uh, information as a way of promoting uh, political agendas. Why? Not because they're so committed politically, because that's what sells, that's what uh, gets the eyeballs, and you know, eyeballs is all what it's all about on the internet. Uh, so I think those are very serious concerns, and I, I do think that uh, newspapers are dying. My wife uh, was a journalism major before she went to law school, uh, and uh, she left journalism in the mid-90s. And I think even then she realized it was a pretty tough business, but now it's, it's awful. Uh, for all the reasons that uh, the judge mentioned. Uh, and I don't really see things improving much. I think when it comes to international coverage, there'll probably be a few newspapers that still keep doing that. 
Uh, and uh, so I think we'll have the fewer foreign bureaus of the St. Louis, uh, is it Post-Dispatch? I always get them. Yes, so, uh, and uh, of uh, various other newspapers that are serious newspapers, but not the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, but there probably will be New York Times, Wall Street Journal, AP, and also foreign sources, uh, Agence France Press and various other places, Reuters, I guess it's a multinational one. Um, but when it comes to local coverage, uh, coverage of local politics or city hall matters and the like, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to maintain that. Now, some of that might be taken up by, say, community blogs or some other such things, uh, uh, which actually would work very well on a local level. But there's a limit to how well they can work without paid staff who are out there with their sources and calling people up and, and uh, uh, doing things on a professional footing. I think it's a very serious issue. I don't know what the answer is. I will say I'm less troubled by the, by the growth in advocacy sources because I, my sense is that there have been a lot of advocacy sources in the past. They just weren't labeled advocacy sources. Uh, and likewise, when it comes to accuracy, just setting aside bias and just error, I think newspapers are actually a lot less accurate than uh, than they're given credit for. And one test is, think about news coverage of, a, of an area you know well, say some technical area, say you're a physicist, newspaper coverage of physics. And you probably find a lot of errors and gross oversimplifications to the point that they are virtually errors. Well, that's exactly the same in every other field, you just don't notice it. I certainly notice it with regard to law. So, and part of the reason it's not bias, it's just, that there are very few people who have a real law beat or at least, let's say, appellate law beat. Linda Greenhouse writes about the Supreme Court. She has her point of view, but at least she knows the Supreme Court very well. But a typical person writing, uh, writing for a newspaper, could be even the LA Times, a serious newspaper about, about courts, doesn't really know that much about it. I know this because they call me up and they ask me for a quote. And I talk to them about it. And I don't have much sense that they actually really know what they're talking about. With luck, they understood what I told them, what the other sources told them. But often it gets really mangled. There's one, this is the, not the LA Times, but Santa Barbara. Again, I forget the name of the paper. But this, pardon, the, the, the press? Just news, news press. press. Santa Barbara News Press called me up and asked me a, whether a marina owner is entitled to exclude a boat that has a vulgar name. And, and I see the story and it says, Eugene Wallach said, the, the marina owner has a right to hypocrisy. <laughs> and then I realized what I said, I said, right to his property, his property. What are you going to do at that point? At least with the internet, at least maybe they'll fix it. But in the print thing, it's beyond that. Look, if he screwed up my quote and screwed it up not just as a typo, but screwed it up, obviously he didn't understand what I was talking about. Because I gave him a long spiel about how he's got property rights and this and that. If he understood that, he would understand that maybe he had a noisy connection. But we're pretty good at disambiguating things as listeners if we understand the context. He didn't understand the context. So the question is how many other articles written by this reporter and his colleagues have similar errors that we just don't notice. So maybe what I'm saying is it's not so bad now because it was pretty bad back then too. So relatively speaking, I'm not sure how much we've lost, but I do agree. I think in some measure we've lost something. I think that's right. Let me ask you change the subject just slightly, Eugene. Um, so I went to UCLA Law School um, in 1972 uh, and graduated in 1975. Uh, you went, what, 20 years? 89 to 92. Okay, so, uh, and now we are, so you were more or less halfway between then now. So when I was in law school, I remember I had a professor who in class made fun of my accent. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was funny, terrifically funny. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the story gets, so he, he's, uh, this is Jim Creer, he still teaches at Michigan. And when I go to Michigan, people actually say to me, did Professor Creer really make fun of your accent in class? And I say yes, and they expect me to be distressed about it. I thought it was swell. 
Now, I am told by professor after professor, um, those who taught then and teach now, that they would never, ever do anything like that in class. Um, whether that they would get into ter terrific trouble and that they are much more careful about making jokes, about making uh, uh, any kind of reference that might thought to be offensive. And that it limits, uh, in many ways, not just sort of uh, spontaneity of discussion, uh, but also makes them much more cautious about being creative in class. I is that the case? So I think it probably is in some measure. Um, but I think one has to look at it from the perspective of an institution, first of all, that has a job to do, and I as a teacher have a job to do. I have to not just communicate certain information, but engage the students in learning. And I have to do that job effectively. And the other thing, and I'm, this may be coincidence rather than cause, but it is another factor that I think probably helps this in some measure along is the students in the classroom are paying a lot more than they did back in your time or in my time. So I figure if they're going to be paying us $40,000 a year, uh, I probably wouldn't be making fun of, of their accent. Some people might react very well to it. Some people might not. Some of, the listen some of the people being made fun of might think it's a great joke, but some of their neighbors, might, neighbors in the classroom might feel a little uneasy, uncomfortable about it. And, you know, unease, being uneasy and uncomfortable sometimes actually helps teaching, sometimes doesn't, sometimes it's a distraction. So I think with regard to, with regard to kind of politeness of how you treat um, how you treat but, uh, but that, students. The, yes. the, some of the point that I was making is nobody thought it was impolite. It was, you know, I didn't think of it, and nobody walked to me afterwards and said, oh, do you feel bad? That, you know, everybody took it in the spirit. It, 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 it wasn't a mean making fun of my accent. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was a, uh, and that wasn't the only example. That seems to be the one that, that, that I remember. You know, I wonder if people have gotten more sensitive or more, yeah. uh, and, and whether the uh, idea that it's not just what you say in class, but that somebody might be out there with a iPhone mm -hmm. taping yeah. or videotaping, and the thing that in context of what you were saying, yeah. that in class and with your class, with your students, mm -hmm. And I don't just mean students, I mm -hmm. mean in many other yeah. contexts, city council meetings, all sorts of things like that. The, the thing that in context may seem to everybody present may seem perfectly benign, once it is clipped and put online, becomes your political death or your... your, your uh, yeah. And I, I wonder whether that is not one of the private ways in which speech is being suppressed, or speech is being, the spontaneity and the freedom of speech is being, be, being repressed? Yeah, so, so it's an interesting question. There are a lot of things going on there. All of them, I think, are quite important. So one is social taboos, and maybe not quite taboo. You wouldn't get thrown a volcano for it, but it's kind of social things that are, that are frowned upon. Those have been around for a very long time. Uh, they've changed over time. I mean, it used to be the taboo was saying, say, vulgarity is in front of women. Well, you know, uh, that's, that one's fallen by the wayside. Uh, is it good? Is it bad? Well, it's different. Things change in some measure along those lines. And a lot of the taboos are not just, uh, uh, not just about form. They're also about substance. There are certain things that people w wouldn't want to say because they were they were seen as so outrageous uh, uh, that, that they would be a black mark in one's career and such. So I think some amount of that has, has always been around. It's shifted some. I will say that, uh, uh, that I don't think making fun, it sounds like your experience with Jim Creer wasn't that he was, he was being impolite to the point of being rude, but I'm not sure he was being affirmatively polite. I don't think of Miss Manners were teaching a class. She I loved it. Pardon? Well, so, I loved it. But many people love things that are impolite, right? This is, a, it's like imagine the professor started telling, uh, telling vulgar jokes. A lot of people might have, might think it's very, very funny. But it doesn't quite rise, doesn't quite meet the standards of, of politeness. Uh, I'm getting, I'm digressing here. The bottom line is, I think there are good reasons why, 
when we are being paid by our audience to teach them, we ought to think a little bit about how we can effectively teach them. Now, if that means that there are substantive points that we're not going to be making, that, I think, is no service to them, and it's untrue to the mission of the university. And I try very hard to make sure that I don't censor myself as to the substantive points. But as a matter of form, I mean, just even little things like it used to be, and at least according to the paper chase, it's a movie, must be true, uh, that professors really would kind of mock students who make mistakes and such. I, wouldn't, I don't think I would have done it back then, I hope. I certainly wouldn't do it now. Again, among other things, because they're paying me good money and not, not to be mocked. Now, the point about the, the, the recordability of that, I think, is a very important point. And it's a double-edged sword that, uh, on the one hand, on the one hand, people really are more likely to not say certain things when people are watching. On the other hand, I'm a public servant. I'm being employed by the taxpayers to teach other taxpayers. Again, these days it's mostly the students who are paying themselves, but you know, the taxpayers are backing their loans, and I'm still getting some of that. So if somebody were to come in and say, you know, well, I'm going to be recording this class, I feel, you know, I think the public, I can't say, no, this is a private matter. It's not a private matter. It's in front of 75 people on, on the taxpayer dime, and especially in things like city council meetings and the like. So I see the downside, but I also see the upside, that maybe we can now see uh, what our elected representatives, let's say, or what our public servants are doing and how they're behaving themselves and what they're saying, uh, and, uh, uh, and they can't get away with as much, as much bad stuff uh, uh, as, as they could once upon a time. So I don't know. I don't know. I think there are pluses and minuses. I'm not sure. I think we have a question back there. Well, but I'm sorry. I thought we, we had written questions. Was that the, the policy? Yes, yeah, speaking of speech restrictions. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind oral questions. Uh, uh, Either uh, way, whether, whether, whether there was ones. But I'm sorry, do you, do you want to say anything else? No, no, no. I think... I think uh, you must have something to say. Huh? You always do, Judge. <laughs> You know, if we keep saying something every time, no, I, th I, think, I think we're ready for questions. You know, let's, let's shift to questions, and I'm sure the questions will prod us. Do you think America would benefit from an official secrets act as exists in the UK? Thank you. 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 Thank you government employees and others who are given information on uh, um, uh, essentially in exchange for a promise of confidentiality that punish them for breaking that confidentiality. The persecution of Bradley Manning for leaking the stuff to WikiLeaks is that. Here he is, he's in the military, he's a government employee and a soldier and somebody with a security clearance and he violates the rules. Not allowed. I just heard on the news query whether how accurate it is, but apparently some members of the SEAL, the SEAL team that killed bin Laden are being disciplined. Why? Because they leaked, so probably for money, some of the information about the raid to video game creators. It's a very, very 2012 sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, disciplinary infraction, and I don't think they're being, uh, they're being shot or being imprisoned for a long time, but they're being punished because you signed up to keep a secret, among other things, and you're not allowed to leak the secrets, even to our friends in, uh, in the video game industry. Um, uh, the question often is, what happens? What happens if somebody who never signed any promise of confidentiality gets his hands on it? What happens when the New York Times gets its hands on something? What happens when WikiLeaks gets its hands on something? And there actually are statutes that uh, do indeed try to punish that. They're just very rarely enforced and raise serious First Amendment questions. I'm inclined to say that valuable as secrecy is, it's also costly. That secrecy not only allows people to get away with, with <coughs> criminal things or misconduct, it allows people to hire their bureaucratic goof-ups. And it very commonly is used for precisely that. Secrecy also means that the only people who are talking within the government about something are those people who are in the small inner circle. It's easy to fall into groupthink that way. It's easy to, uh, to miss important other perspectives. And when, when others learn about it and when there's public discussion, there often is useful information that comes back. Again, it's hard to tell the real costs and benefits. One could certainly imagine situations where a newspaper's publishing a, uh, uh, something that was leaked to them would cause tremendous damage. Uh, but I think 
Under modern First Amendment law, that would probably be not permissible. Though a close question, and one on which at least one federal district court has disagreed. Spe incidentally, that's an interesting case. Of course, it involves uh, somebody who, uh, uh, not, uh, somebody I think was working for maybe IPAC, because of course, Jews, you know, we're troublemakers. So he, uh, he got some documents from a source, and then called up some journalists about them and said, hey, I think his name is Rosen, if I recall correctly. Uh, hey, um, uh, here are these interesting documents, so I want you to run them. I think in part because he thought that they revealed uh, some uh, insufficient support for Israel by the part of the administration or something along those lines. And then he was prosecuted. Remember, he wasn't exactly the ultimate publisher, but he was a speaker. He was communicating this information to the newspapers, and he never signed a... Uh, uh, a non-disclosure agreement, never signed, never got a security clearance, wasn't a government employee. So he really was in the shoes of, say, a New York Times or a WikiLeaks that might be prosecuted. Uh, and there was a federal uh, district court decision, so a trial court decision, that held that he could indeed be prosecuted for this. And for some reason, it never made its way up uh, on appeal. So it's an interesting question. Can UN resolutions supersede the United States First Amendment or any of the constitutional rights of the United States? UN resolutions? Mm -hmm. No. Good. No. No, I'm with you on that. The one, the one concern is, and there are some international law scholars that actually say this is not a bug, it's a feature, is that uh, the doctrine, the First Amendment is written there in the Constitution, but it's not very precise. The protection that we have of free speech comes from case law, from precedents written by judges. Why do judges decide the way they do? Because of their particular worldview. Uh, they're bound by precedent in considerable measure, but when the question is what precedent to set, that's a big influence. And it turns out that a lot of the precedents in the mid-1900s were set by judges who had a very broadly pro-free speech worldview. When, if there looks to be an international consensus somehow developing along, among people that judges find influential, maybe even when they're young law students, when they're first kind of acquiring their sense of things, it may be that a future generation of judges will internalize the norms of these UN resolutions and say not, well, the UN resolution trumps the First Amendment. That they would not say. But that, well, the right way to interpret the First Amendment is something other than what other judges thought some decades ago. And why do they do it? Maybe even subconsciously because they're influenced by that. So that's why I do worry about attempts to kind of generate international well, norms that are speech restricting. Well, uh, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, remember Harper versus Poe schools? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 I think the case is that I can certainly talk about the case as it was when it came to yeah. us. It, it may still be bubbling somewhere. Uh, so um, uh, in 19... Uh, Oh God, I forget the, those dates again, but somewhere there in the m middle of the Vietnam War, the Supreme Court decided a case by the name of Tinker uh, versus Wisconsin. Des Moines. So, Des Moines. One of the Wisconsin's. Yeah, one of those. Des Moines. Oh, it was Iowa, not Wisconsin. Yeah, exactly. Okay. One of those. Guys. See, this is why it's good to have the professor here. Uh, but the important thing about Tinker is it was a bunch of school kids who wore black armbands to school and uh, in protest of the war. Did I get that much right? That's right. Okay. And uh, the Supreme Court said, well, uh, school children are citizens, are people just like everybody else. They come to school and they cannot be prohibited from expressing their views in ways that don't disrupt the class. So uh, armbands are obviously very passive and they have a right to, to, to uh, you know, that's, it's not like they are uh, using a megaphone or they are, they are, they are uh, uh, standing up in class and disrupting the class by, 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 by making speeches. It's a passive thing and they are entitled to express their views. Uh, and uh, this is a generally held view of the First Amendment that if you're a school kid, if you're a child in school, uh, you, you have limited First Amendment rights, but nevertheless you have First Amendment rights so long as you don't interfere with the class. Uh, so, uh, so we had a case um, that put that proposition to the test about uh, uh, three or four years ago. It's called Harper versus Poe Schools. And this was a case where a student wore a, wore a t-shirt that had an anti-homosexual message. Um, I, I am gonna have to 
um, dredge my memory so exactly what it said, but it was something like uh, men should not do that which God believes to be uh, wrong, and uh, on the back it had something similar. The school didn't do much to him. Basically, it said, "Go home, son, and get a clean shirt, get, get, you know, or put on something about." It. And the justification of the school was, uh, and he said, "Well, it's just like the armband. I, I you know, I, I am in class. I'm not disrupting. I'm not making any speeches. Uh, I am entitled to express my point of view." Particularly since a day or two before they had had um, uh, various school activities which uh, he construed as being um, uh, uh, supporting uh, homosexuality or sexual uh, um, uh, or, um, people of different sexual orientation. And his view was that uh, that is contrary to his religious belief that, and he felt that he should express a point of view in opposition. Uh, it came to us, I, uh, I heard the case with uh, two of my, uh, you know, very smart and, uh, uh, you know, uh, colleagues that I, I truly value, uh, Judge Reinhardt and uh, Judge Sidney Thomas, uh, truly two of the brightest uh, and fairest uh, judges we have, and we came to different conclusions. Um, I said it's just like a, it's just like the armband. And they said, well, no, this is different because this hurts people. And other students viewing the message, if they are of a different sexual orientation, they would feel hurt by this. And this is a situation where you take something that, that essentially the, the consensus, liberal point of view works just fine, so long as you agree with the message. So what you had was, I think, judges in Washington, justices in the Tinker case that had doubts about the war, saw this was a legitimate point of view, and this is how they, they came out and decided in the Tinker case. Now you have people using the same message uh, or the same methodology to convey messages that are not um, uh, uh, commensurate, then, you, 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 then people sort of, uh, this is consistent with what Eugene was saying, you start viewing the, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, world from a different perspective. So one of the arguments that was made is, well, the armbands didn't really attack anybody. It's not like the t-shirt. But I'm thinking, well, what if you're another student and uh, your older brother has just gotten shot and killed in Vietnam, uh, and you understand this to be a message that what we're doing in Vietnam is aggression and is illegitimate and we really should not have troops. Uh, and those of you who remember, those of us who remember the protest against the, uh, the Vietnam War, it wasn't just a disagreement about policy, but there was some sort of view that our soldiers there uh, were committing uh, essentially um, um, crimes by, by even being in Vietnam. So um, I think what Eugene says is right. I think what happens is we cannot, uh, we cannot isolate ourselves from the outside world and things like UN resolutions, things like the fact that in France, for example, and um, Germany, um, um, uh, was it eBay? Uh, um, you cannot sell Nazi memorabilia uh, on eBay, uh, you know, and to some extent, all that stuff is not lost on us. And to some extent, if the world moves um, uh, and uh, to, you know, judges interpret the First Amendment, which is, again, very vague, uh, it's not at all clear that, uh, even though it might not as a matter of law um, um, uh, make a difference, but that uh, in fact, it causes us to view the world through a different uh, filter. Uh, let me add one, I think that's, that's all exactly right. Let me add one little fact, a uh, little factoid. Um, there is one judge that I know of, uh, uh, no longer a judge, uh, who wrote an opinion that is the most, uh, goes the furthest towards allowing not UN resolutions, but perceived customs of international law to trump free speech rights. That judge was Robert Bork when he was in the D.C. Circuit. Mm -hmm. There was a case called Boos v. Berry, and it involved uh, a, uh, um, a protest outside the Nicaraguan embassy by anti-communists. Uh, so, in fact, I am quite sure that 
Judge Bork quite liked that speech. But there was a DC uh, ordinance that banned hostile protests or hostile demonstrations outside of that embassy. So you can go out there waving signs saying, uh, 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 viva uh, uh, the uh, Los Sandinistas, Los Sandinistas, whatever else, I don't know, Spanish actually, uh, or uh, happy Greek Independence Day, but you can't go out there and have, uh, have uh, critical signs. And Judge Bork wrote an opinion uh, for the DC Circuit, uh, for DC Circuit panel, I think, saying, well, there's an international law norm of protecting, uh, um, protecting uh, ambassadors and consuls, not just from attack, but from insult. And this is narrowly tailored to the compelling interest in complying with our international obligations. Went up on appeal to the US Supreme Court, just as Brennan, joined by Marshall Stevens, and in, no, I'm sorry, I think the lead opinion was Justice O'Connor, my former boss, joined by Brennan, Marshall Stevens, and Scalia, uh, struck a doubt, said, no, this is constitutionally protected. And Justice Rehnquist, Chief Justice Rehnquist, also very conservative, joined by Justice White and Justice Blackman, who was kind of a mix, he was sort of going from his very, from his, from his mid-conservative to kind of eventually his mid-liberal and very liberal uh, uh, stage, uh, uh, said no, Judge Bork had it right. So there, there was at least one opinion of the DC Circuit, which got three votes on the US Supreme Court for the proposition that at least some kinds of speech restrictions are justifiable by international law considerations. But it didn't come from the left. It, it came from the right, very firmly on the right. That's interesting because I have a few questions here that also revolve around uh, the idea of insulting an mm -hmm. entity or a religion. Um, can Islam be criticized as a totalitarian ideology? Uh, if so, does it get more restricted since the U.S. signed agreements in the U.N. and Hillary Clinton said in December 2011 she would prosecute insults of religion? As well as another question on um, uh, to Professor Volokh, uh, should not fellow law professor um, uh, should not fellow law professors of Dr. Abu Fadl at the UCLA School of Law, who is a champion of Sharia law, challenge him regarding his stand on the movement worldwide to implement a quote blasphemy law, the so-called insult law, in contravention of the First Amendment? I have a couple of other questions about. Um, signing international treaties, outlying criticism of Islam, and what have they passed, and so forth and so on. There's a lot of concern about that. Um, so I am I'm very skeptical that, uh, that Secretary of State Clinton committed to prosecuting insults of Islam. I do not recall any such statements on her part. There have been some statements. Fortunately, she's Secretary of State and other exactly. Attorney General. Among <laughs> other things, she's Secretary of State. But I hear, but I hear she knows the Attorney General. But still, I don't think she said anything to, the, to, 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 to that effect. Mm -hmm. She has in the past said things that are, I think, less militantly pro-free speech than I would like. And I've criticized some of those. But on balance, the US has actually taken a pretty good stand on these things. As to call it Abu al-Fadl, um, I, I recall getting this email from somebody saying, why aren't you denouncing his views of Sharia and Islam? And my answer is, he is a scholar of Islamic law. He knows Arabic. He has this library full of all of these books about Islam, and he has written all of these books about Islam, I don't know whether he's right or wrong. And I'm not going to know whether he's right or wrong. So don't ask me to criticize the body of his work, which I have no idea about for all I know. Maybe he's completely right in his analysis. Now, as if he were to argue in favor of criminalizing criticism of, of Islam, I would happily criticize him, as I have criticized other people, including my former co-blogger, Eric Posner, whom I had as a, as a fellow, I'd invited to join my blog, and he was on my blog for a while. I criticized him for that, but again, I have, I have not heard anything about Professor Abu al-Fadl doing that. The bigger picture question is, are you allowed to criticize Islam? Yes, just like you're allowed to criticize Judaism and Christianity and feminism and environmentalism and communism and anything else. Are all those criticisms sound? I suppose some are and some are not. There are a billion Muslims out there. My guess is they're pretty varied. 
we, we know from knowing fellow Jews, there are Jews and then there are Jews. Uh, and there, are, there was this rabbi recently who uh, said some ridiculous things around the same time as the Saudi uh, uh, imam said some ridiculous things. I just blogged about it a couple of hours ago um, about Hurricane Sandy. The imam said that hur uh, Hurricane Sandy is God's punishment on America for Iraq and Afghanistan. And the rabbi said it's God's punishment in America, uh, on New York and New Jersey for considering the legalization of same-sex marriage. So now my sense is there are more sort of people with zany views like that in <coughs> Islam as a fraction of Muslims than there are as a fraction of Jews. Still, there are a billion people out there and I would be hesitant to say all Muslims believe this or Islam somehow inherently means this. Just like I'd be hesitant to say Judaism inherently means this or Christianity means this. So some of the criticisms of, of Islam I think are overstated. Some I think are quite right and all of them are constitutionally protected. I don't see any action on the part of our government right now at least or in the foreseeable future trying to restrict that. Foreign governments is a very different story, but our government has generally, on balance, been pretty good on this. You know, this is actually, when I talked earlier about uh, how different we are, uh, it is specifically this issue, and that is um, uh, comments that um, are aggressively uh, critical of religion, of certain religion, particularly Islam, uh, that um, uh, judges from other countries just, just can't understand that this is protected. Is, they, they, they have a great deal of difficulty saying, well, this is hurtful, this is not uh, constructive. And um, in, in this way, we really are uh, quite unique uh, in, 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 in the world in that uh, our law would have to change, our interpretation of the First Amendment would have to change so radically that I do not foresee this happening in the lifetime of any of us, and hopefully never, uh, that, that um, somebody can't stand on a street corner and, 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 uh, or get on a blog or get a microphone and criticize uh, bitterly um, uh, any religion. Whether it's a wise thing to do, whether it's a constructive thing to do, that's an entirely different question. Uh, but uh, I, I think we're, uh, uh, we're pretty safe in that regard. A couple of um, questions along the same area uh, about is hate speech protected? Um, also dovetailing into that, isn't political correctness a form of speech censorship? What is politically incorrect and hate speech to other people is a form of, of censorship? Well, it depends. I mean, it depends what you mean by hate speech, but generally hate speech is protected. Uh, uh, there, there are really only very limited categories of speech that the Supreme Court has said are not protected. Things that are, um, um, well, copyright infringement, of course, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to begin with that. Um, um, uh, 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 defamation. Uh, that, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, uh, defamation, uh, and even defamation, if it is against a public figure, it's, it's very difficult to prove. Uh, there is uh, uh, fighting words, which means you say things that are likely to cause somebody else to hit you in the nose. And it's that limited. And has there ever been a case where anybody has gotten um, prosecuted for fighting words? You know, it's actually not that uncommon, or it's not common, but not that uncommon in lower courts. The Supreme Court has never had a published opinion since 1942. Chaplinsky. Uh, since Chaplinsky up upholding such a conviction. They happen occasionally. It's almost always really face-to-face -face insults. It has Person to be. Face-to-face -face You say something that, that causes somebody to actually resolve. And it's got to be about him. It's not just expressing a view that he really dislikes. It's got to be you. Yeah, or your mother, or something. You know, exactly. so, 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 especially your mother. Especially your mother. So, so it, 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 but it's that limited. Uh, there is incitement to riot. There's yelling, uh, yelling, um, fire in a crowded theater. Falsely yelling. If it's Thank true, you. it could be good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, falsely yelling, fire in a crowded theater, and I think have I left threats, threats, and child pornography. Yeah. Threats. That's right. Threats yeah. is an important one. And if you get outside of those narrow categories, it's pretty much uh, um, not uh, possible to, 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 to prohibit. So, you know, hate speech, uh, there are various things that can happen to you uh, civilly, and there are various things 
And I was talking about sort of non-governmental restrictions. Uh, very bad things can happen to you, particularly with the internet. Uh, you uh, identify who you are. You can get you can get your uh, if you have a Facebook account. You can you can uh, you can get tons of emails. You can get threatening notes yourself in the mail. There are all sorts of things that can happen to you on a private basis. But as far as the government is concerned, it's really uh, uh, very difficult uh, and probably legally impossible for them to do anything. No, I think that's exactly right. There is no hate speech exception. People talk about hate speech and everything. In fact, I think one of the successes, unfortunately, of those who have called for some such exception is to make people think hate speech is a bit of legal labeling, kind of like fighting words or obscenity or threats, so therefore it must have legal significance. But it's not. The Supreme Court has never recognized a hate speech exception, and in fact it's rejected calls for those, for, for those kinds of exceptions. Certain kinds of things that are labeled hate speech might be punishable as threats. If you say, I'm going to kill you because of your race or sex or whatever else, or for that matter, I'm going to kill you, period, that's a punishable threat. But there is no hate speech exception. Political correctness, kind of like hate speech, but even more so, is one of those labels that is just so vague and broad that it's, I think it's not, not very helpful to analysis. Is it true that there are certain things that there are social sanctions for saying? Yes, that's true. As I said, that's always been so. In some measure, that's right. There ought to be social sanctions for people, let's say, insulting one another on a variety of bases, including race, religion, sex, and so on and so forth. Uh, is it true that if you go out there and, uh, uh, and uh, um, for example, uh, uh, criticize same-sex marriage, then people might look at you funny, and very, very rarely, but sometimes you may actually get fired from your job? Yes, that's a bad thing. That happens in some measure. Again, I'm sure that it happened in the past. It just wasn't about same-sex marriage, it was about other things. Obviously, advocating communism once upon a time got you fired understandably, uh, but likewise other things would have as well in the past. Uh, advocating atheism, criticizing the government in time of war, being seen as unpatriotic. The fact is there are going to be social sanctions, including some economic sanctions, uh, that are imposed on people who are doing or saying th uh, things that are seen as rude, indecent, and so on and so forth. Some of that's good, some of that's bad. But it's not like some new thing. It used to be back in the 30s and 40s, you could say anything you pleased and you'd never get fired for it, you'd never get shouted at for it, you'd never get socially ostracized for it. Of course you could. And some of that, as I said, was proper and some of it wasn't. It's, I think, more helpful to ask about specific questions such as whether there is risk of firing at a private university or disciplinary action or something like that at a university than to uh, talk about uh, using the label of political correctness. In fact, uh, in the 30s, uh, Hollywood had the code uh, where if you want to see a movie, it would be subject to the censorship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, f I forget what the code was called. But, uh, Hayes. Hayes, yeah. uh, there we go, a code. And, um, you know, I agree with Eugene, I think to some extent, the ability to exercise private sanctions for speech is itself a form of expression. Uh, I have not gone to see a Jane Fonda movie since she went to Hanoi. I, I just won't do it. I, I, uh, I, I don't advertise it, and it's not a big deal now, but I simply stop wanting to spend my dollars uh, going to... Uh, and that's, that's my way of expressing myself. It's a, it's, it's a quiet way of doing it, but this is my means of expression. So I, I think there's something to be said for the idea that if people say things that you find offensive, that there are sometimes private and sometimes organized ways in which people who say those things should be made to suffer. It's now much easier with the internet. If you want to have a group, if, if somebody says something publicly that you dislike, uh, you may you know, we may all want to stand up for uh, their First Amendment right to say it and that they should not get punished at all. But if it's really something that we find offensive, there's a First Amendment right also to organize and make them suffer some civil consequences from that. Mm -hmm. Speaking of movies, although not very good movies, does the new uh, proposition regarding, regarding the use of condoms in adult films impinge upon the First Amendment rights of filmmakers? 
So you, you so, ask him, I just So this ah. sounds funny. <laughs> this sounds funny. But this, it turns out, actually um, is a kind of, once you start thinking about it, you reach a question that came before the California courts in the mid 80s uh, that I don't think anybody's had a really satisfactory answer to. Generally speaking, the fact that you're making a movie doesn't give you the right to break the law. So the Crush Video ban said you can't distribute any movies that, uh, it wasn't just Crush Videos, but that depicted animal cruelty. But it's clear that if there's an animal cruelty law, you can't say, hey, I get an exemption from that. I want to go out there and torture this bunny because after all, I'm making a movie in which the bunny is supposed to be tortured. You don't get any exemption for that. Uh, so that's all well and good. Uh, let's forget about the condoms question. Uh, people who make pornographic movies, generally, I guess these days, supposedly, there's, there, they don't have to do that anymore, but they, they used to have to pay actors and actresses to be in it. So they're paying people to have sex. That sounds like essentially pandering the flip side of prostitution. Now, the typical transaction in a prostitution context is pay people to have sex with you, but generally speaking, if you go out there and hire two people to have sex in front of you, because that's how you get your jollies, you would be guilty of, you know, you could frame it as aiding and abetting prostitution because they are, after all, paid to have a sexual act or pandering or something along those lines. In fact, it used to be not uncommon that there, that there were persecutions of people who put on kind of these live shows, live sex shows. And by sex show, I mean shows of people actually having sex. That was seen as pandering. Well, how is a pornographic movie maker different under that law? Forget about the content of what they're doing. In the process, they're paying people to have sex. So this issue came up to the California Supreme Court, and in People v. Freeman in 1989 or so, it, the court said, well, no, there is a First Amendment right here to hire people to have sex. And I think the theory was, if you want to make a porn movie, which you have a right to do, you have to do this. So applying the law in this kind of situation. So long as you don't enjoy it. Exactly. So long as you, the filmmaker, don't enjoy it. Exactly. Maybe there would be a compulsory rule that only gay men could make uh, could make uh, movies straight, 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 straight sex, straight, right. and only straight men and with gay sex. That that, that might be a might be a, well, a what, a, what about the orgy movies? Yeah, that would be hard. That would be difficult. Um, in any event, it never came to that, but the court actually said that. So I suppose you could argue that I want to make a movie which shows sex in the natural without this condom getting in the way, and I can't do that. I can't do that with this proposition. I think it would be very hard uh, a, a hard uh, uh, case to make, partly because of the public health reasons and partly because these days it's easier than ever actually to edit movies. So really if you make it, you probably could edit, uh, edit it out. So that's a very long way of saying I think the, the law would be upheld against any such challenge, but it turns out to be a theoretically much more complex question than it first appears. Hmm. Prior restraint. Prior restraint is not a very helpful term uh, in these kinds of situations. Um, I was just doing a declaration in the case try today trying to explain the difference. It's uh, what is and is not a prior restraint is hard to tell, among other things, because all laws that punish speech after the fact deter it before the fact because people are afraid of being punished. Conversely, uh, often the very reason you, you try to restrain speech before the, uh, uh, beforehand is the very reason that uh, uh, the punishment is imposed because of, of the danger that, that, that the speech poses. As a result, it turns out that the legal doctrines having to do with prior restraint used to be very important back when subsequent punishment wasn't seen as clearly triggering the First Amendment. That's what I said was happening around the time of the framing of the Constitution up until the early 1900s. These days, it actually doesn't, that label doesn't do as much work as, as it might first seem. Um, if making a threat is not protected free speech, then why wasn't Ahmadinejad prosecuted at the UN for stating uh, that he would like to annihilate Israel? UN? Diplomatic immunity? <laughs> uh, yeah, liking to do no, something, yeah. uh, liking, I mean, yeah, I, don't, exactly. I don't know exactly what he said. Yeah. But I think there are many things we'd like to do. Yeah. A threat is something that's very narrowly defined, 
uh, and um, it is it is a uh, you actually have to uh, convey the idea that you plan to uh, cause somebody physical harm uh, and either directly or conditionally uh, I'll cause you physical harm if you don't do X or if you do X or just to wait I'm going to come after you and put a bullet through your head something something of like that so that that, that would be a threat uh, saying gee I you know drop dead or I wish you were dead that's not a threat um, I mean if that was a threat a lot of people would get yeah. prosecuted and it's especially true if I wish all Jews drop dead, I wish all Muslims drop dead or whatever else. At that level of generality, the law stops viewing it as a threat and more as a statement of political ideology or a statement of desire or whatever else. It's, what is and is not a threat is act, itself an interesting also and difficult question. We've got lots of those that came up uh, today. Uh, but generally speaking, the more specifically targeted a particular person is, the more likely it is to be a threat. Uh, the, the other thing that's necessary for a threat, you have to have the apparent ability to carry it out. Uh, so, uh, again, I, I don't know exactly what, what he said, but uh, so long as we don't think he has a, a nuclear weapon, it would probably be very hard for him to carry out any yeah. threat that would be sort of general killing of even uh, all the Jews in, uh, in Israel. Yeah, but more broadly, look, if he were trying to go out there and... Uh, uh, and uh, 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 if it seems very likely that he is trying to go out there and get a nuclear bomb, and that uh, uh, it's, I'm not sure how likely he is to try to use it against Israel, because there are obviously costs to him of doing that, but, uh, uh, but uh, in any event, you know, if we decided we wanted to shoot him, you know, that's what countries sometimes do to, to people who they see to be, a, to be a danger. It's not really something that the criminal justice system is particularly good at. Foreign policy can be handled through wars, it can be handled through various other things. It is very rarely handled through the criminal justice system. And then only in rare situations where the other person has already been defeated. You know, it, I don't want him arrested. I want the, re the uh, reactors bombed or the, the, the labs bombed. The difficulty is it seems that it would be very, very difficult, very, very politically and militarily expensive. And it's not clear we're going to be able to do that. Uh, so if that's not going to happen, then I don't see how threatening to prosecute somebody who has diplomatic immunity for very good reasons uh, when he's at the UN and otherwise is in Iran but outside of our jurisdiction, I, I just don't see that that's, that's the way foreign policy can be helpfully undertaken. Okay, please comment on the future of Citizens United. Clearly correctly decided opinion by the Supreme Court, very solid. I can't imagine it will be overruled. I think that's right. So Citizens United, remember, held that corporations and unions have the right to speak about candidates. It had been long well established that corporations and unions have the right to speak, among other things because most media organizations, most newspapers are owned by corporations. The first case recognizing uh, any free speech claim, essentially striking down any government action on free speech grounds in the U.S. Supreme Court came in 1931. The first case involving uh, striking down government action uh, uh, restricting the speech of a corporation came in 1936. The first case acknowledging the free speech, the free speech rights of non-media corporations came in 1941. So that was always well established. The question is whether there should be an exception for unions and corporations when it comes to speaking about elections. And for a while the court said yes, then in Citizens United said no. The question is what's the future? I think the question is who, uh, who on the court is going to be retiring and when, <coughs> and who's going to be elected in 2016. If Justice Scalia or Justice Kennedy, just to give the example of the two justices in the majority who are, who are the oldest, and therefore most likely to retire, retire uh, within the next four years, just, uh, President Obama will, replace, will appoint a substitute who very likely will take what's kind of now the standard liberal view that Citizens United is wrong, and, and it seems to me likely that they will have little compunction about reversing it, about overturning it, overruling it. 
On the other hand, if uh, uh, the five justice uh, conservative majority stays on the court, and uh, maybe is enhanced uh, after 2016 or something like that, then in that case, it'll be preserved. Unfortunately, I wish I could tell you something about grand legal principles being eternal and unchangeable by mere personnel. No, elections matter, justices matter. Susan United is another one of those cases where um, people get um, enthusiastic about the principle and then it comes back to bite them when it is being exercised by people they don't like. Uh, so, so long as it was unions or newspapers, or, you know, generally liberal leaning people, everybody was sort of gung ho about it, and all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, you know, corporations are also taking advantage of it. We didn't mean for that to happen. We wanted people to be able to speak if they speak the right message. Um, the, the reality is that, you know, and, and there's this discussion when, when people get apoplectic about Citizens United, oh, you are attributing corporations with being real people when they are not real people, they don't have souls, they don't, uh, you know, they, they don't eat, they don't, uh, they don't need a job and things like that. It's all nonsense. Corporations, associations, unions are simply one of several ways in which groups of people can band together and band together their resources to be able to speak and perform other functions. So it seems to me that whether it is a union or a corporation or an association or a partnership or you know wh whatever other way in which people legitimately band together, uh, pool their resources to better be able to speak, uh, strikes me as being uh, just unassailably um, correct to say that they do not lose their First Amendment rights. They are no less able to speak because they choose the corporate form as opposed to using some other form of, uh, uh, of banding together. Uh, so I would like to think that there are immutable constitutional principles that won't change. So I, I'm not so willing to think that um, serious justices, if they, if they think about this, will, will be so anxious to overrule it. Okay, we have here, surveys show that college facilities, including law school facilities, are crushingly leftist, over 95% at most schools. Is this a satisfactory state of affairs, and what can be done about it, if anything? That's faculties. What did I say? College? Oh, okay, faculties. You're right, thank you. I college love my faculties. leftist professors. They so... I was able to sort of push against them and sort of hone my, you know, I thought, I thought it would be great. I could stand up in class and argue with them. I loved it. Made me, made, made me more committed to my way of thinking. Um, I, I think the numbers are a little high. I don't think it's 95%. They're at so, as to some universities, it's not so as to the aggregate. There's still, if, if it's not 95 percent, it's not very far off of that. So uh, the thrust of the question, I think, is sound. I don't think it's optimal. I don't think it's optimal for uh, for teaching. I don't think it's optimal for scholarship. I think that we're more likely to get the truth out of a battle of ideas, and you, you want to have people writing on both sides of a debate. So I think that it would be good if we had more conservatives uh, in the fact uh, in the academy. Uh, there's not a lot I think can be easily done about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some degree of discrimination against conservatives, and I think that needs to be fought, but it's not easy to fight. Because among <coughs> other things, for, uh, if you're hiring a, 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 a professor, uh, the, the colleagues have to evaluate his work. It can't be sort of a, a content-neutral judgment. Now you could say, well, it should be content-based but viewpoint neutral. You should evaluate the work without regard to whether you agree with the viewpoint. And I think that's right. And I think honest professors on both sides of the aisle do that. The difficulty is it's very hard to do that, right? Because if you think, if you're on the left and you see somebody on the right saying things, by definition, there are going to be things you think are wrong. And it's human nature to assume that people who say things they think are wrong are probably not very smart or not very good at what they do. Or, or, now, not, or not very rigorous in their analysis. Exactly, or not very rigorous in their analysis. Now, of course, the right thing to do is to say, well, 
I'm going to try to set that aside. I'm going to see what their argument is and see if it's a plausible and well-crafted argument. But that's very hard to do because it's human nature, again, to cut slack to people on your side when it comes to whether analysis is rigorous and to be super picky about people on the other side. So I think it's very difficult uh, to solve that problem. There's also another problem, which my sense is there are a lot of conservatives who aren't really that into doing that. I think culturally, liberals are more likely to value academic life and conservatives are more likely to value business lives. It's not exclusively so, but I think there's some degree of that tendency. So my sense is that there are a lot of very, very smart, well-credentialed, for example, um, uh, conservative uh, law school grads, a lot of whom just want to become lawyers. That's true of many liberals too, but I think there's also an interest gap as well as possible political discrimination. So I think it's a real problem. It's somewhat overstated in some respects, but it's a real problem. But it's like many problems. It doesn't have a really good solution. Mm -hmm. You know, Eugene is one of the uh, few professors out there that has actually, in a prior life, been an entrepreneur. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you know, but um, um, he, he uh, wrote code and ran a business with his father, uh, a computer business, um, long before it was fashionable. Right, um, but uh, it is true what they say. By and large, uh, Eugene being the exception, that those who can do and those who can't teach. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 but it's more profound than that. I'm, I'm not saying that many professors, if they wanted to or had to do, couldn't do. But it is a it is a choice to to choose a lifestyle where. Uh, uh, putting yourself on the line either by being a lawyer, being an entrepreneur, being, being a businessman, where every day you have to be out there in the marketplace uh, um, uh, competing and doing the things that the businessman is just not, not appealing, uh, where they find the academic life uh, uh, much, much more appealing. And probably they are not, they wouldn't be that good at it if they, if they went out there. And, uh, certainly comparatively, they are much better at teaching than at actually uh, doing. And um, it turns out that uh, people uh, of a conservative bent, uh, either because they come from families where that is, uh, the, you know, that, that are involved in doing things and, and have actually seen uh, what running a business or what uh, being in a profession is like, uh, they, they're more likely to go to that. So, so it's hard, it's hard to attract uh, uh, a lot of conservatives into, into academia. Uh, the, I, th I think the, uh, I know a little bit about the, the, the pool, uh, at least in the legal market, uh, of people who go into academia. Uh, I, I know about the sort of market of uh, law clerks who then move on to, to, many of them go on to academia. And the, the pool is decidedly uh, liberal. And I don't think it's an outgrowth of the fact that they went to schools and they were turned into liberals. If you look at who they are and, and, and uh, the families they come from, and the uh, upbringing they have, and the, you know, they, they, they started out on that side of the fence, and that's pretty much where they stayed. You know, here's one data point. Uh, uh, I hadn't thought of it until I brought this up, but when I clerked, there were 39 law clerks. Basically, you know, Supreme Court, the Supreme Court clerks. Uh, and they, uh, you know, I don't think they split kind of 13 liberals, 13 conservatives, 13 moderates. I think it was a little bit of a liberal skew, but not that much because some of the conservative justices were just more likely to hire conservative, conservative clerks. And I believe that of them all, I was the only one who went into teaching. And there's an asterisk, because to some of them, I'm not a conservative. Uh, so you'd have, to talk to, you'd have to talk to Brother Brett Kavanaugh off the record and see where he places me, for example. Uh, but uh, the liberals, a lot of them went into teaching. And some of it may be that the conservatives couldn't get a job, but you know, if you're a Supreme Court clerk, even if, with a discrimination uh, against you, of which there is some, you can get a job. I think a lot of them are just very happy becoming big firm lawyers. Paul Clement is a classic example. Scalia clerk, very conservative, actually does teach as an adjunct at uh, Georgetown, but he had no interest in being a scholar. He <coughs> became one of the top, uh, uh, top appellate lawyers of his generation, eventually Solicitor General, now back in private practice. So that, that seems, I mean, that was my experience, my year. Well, the year I clerked at the Supreme Court, uh, for those of you who are not lawyers, Supreme Court clerks are the very uh, uh, cream of the crop of any, uh, any year of law school graduate. The, the ones who make the Supreme Court 
are really uh, the very uh, highly, most highly credentialed. Uh, I, um, I was at an event uh, yesterday, the day before, the night before, and I ran to John Spiegel, who's a lawyer at Mangatolls, and, and we were reminiscing about the year that we clerked together at the Supreme Court. And what we specifically reminisced about is being at the, um, uh, this was, we were there during the election between Carter and Ford and um, uh, uh, Carter defeated Ford, and there were several of us clerks who went to the Ford victory party to wait out the results. And I remember who they all were, and there were six of us. There were six of us, I can name you all, who, who were present. There were a couple of clerks for the Chief Justice, um, uh, me, Ken Starr, uh, I think one more uh, from, 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 from uh, that chambers. Uh, there was uh, John Spiegel from uh, White Chambers, there were uh, one or two other clerks, and that was all. Everybody else was on the other side of the fence. This was 1977, remember when, when Ford uh, lost to, to Carter. The numbers have not changed much. I'm sorry, the numbers... Uh, in terms of uh, how many conservatives versus uh, liberals. I mean, I don't know how many... Well, no, 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 uh, my year... They, I mean, there's just more conservative justices. Uh, so my year, uh, two of the Kennedy clerks were conservative, all of the Thomas clerks, all of the Scalia clerks, uh, and uh, two of the O'Connor clerks. So that's 12 pretty, pretty solid conservatives. Okay, yeah. And uh, you know, I think the Rehnquist, some of them may have been apolitical. I don't know where some of the Rehnquist clerks uh, uh, stood. Uh, but yeah, so I think there were at least a good third who were, who were conservatives, and the others ranged from very liberal to probably moderate. Interesting. OK, a uh, little change of subject here. What do you think of the HHS mandate regarding religious organizations, schools, businesses, and hospitals, uh, forcing them to provide contraceptives and abort abortifacient drugs despite the moral teachings they are obligated to, fo to follow. It seems the federal government is acti actively trying to squash freedom of religion. Judge, do you want to just stick to free speech? Religious freedom is an in it's another very thorny question. I mean, thorny, very complicated question. Or do you want to, I mean, you want to answer it? Yeah, I think we probably better skip that one. Then. Might come up. Yeah. Yeah, it may also, it may also come before the judge in a future case. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, I haven't heard about this one. Have you heard of an effort to place um, regulation of the internet under the UN? You know, I heard mutterings. I, I don't think there's any there there. But, you know, if somebody has something you want to email me, I'd love to have a look at it. Is it? You know, as I said, if you have some hard data on it, drop me an email. I'm, I'm skeptical about such claims. You get heard mutterings. I don't know of anything mm -hmm. that, that actually is, fits that bill. And um, one more quickie. Is issuing a fatwa, i.e. Khomeini and with Salman Rushdie, protected by international law? Or is that just non-applicable to international law? I don't know much about international law. Yeah, I don't know much about international the law. The one thing I know about either. international law is there's no place to go enforce it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... We don't have international police uh, except Interpol arrest people for domestic crimes. If a country wanted to punish somebody within its borders for issuing a fatwa, that would be n not a violation of international law. It's, it may or may not be punished, uh, uh, a protected speech uh, within the country's domestic legal system, probably wouldn't be. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's not, so it's not like an international law affirmatively protects the issuance of fatwas. Uh, international law does make it hard for a country, let's say, to go out there and kidnap Khomeini, let's say, in 1982, and bring him to some other country in order to have him stand trial. That, I think, international law would have a thing or two to say about. But as usual with international law, the real problems aren't the international law problems, they're the geopolitical problems, that nobody really cared enough about Salman Rushdie to actually want to go out there and start a war with Iran over him, and understandably. I mean, I, I say as somebody who did care a lot about Salman Rushdie, but I still wouldn't, didn't care enough about him that I would want to start a war with Iran uh, over him. So it's not really a matter of international law, really. 
It's a matter of what can and cannot be done, and the bottom line is foreign heads of state and other such people, whether they're Ahmadinejad or Khomeini, are largely untouchable. So, um, so there are several things going on here. One is the administration's mis misattribution of the Benghazi incident of the video, or apparently that had really nothing to do with the video. Second question is administration's criticism of the video. I think it was misguided in some measure, but the administration is perfectly free to criticize speech. Government, uh, first of all, some of their officials have their own, in a sense, free speech rights, but even when they're speaking wearing their official hats, that's one of the things the government does, is it speaks, it criticizes, it counter-speaks. That's something it's entitled to do. Now, the video itself is, is out there. I don't think it's been taken down. It's been blocked in some countries, but it's out there. So the interesting question is about the, the jailing of the guy. So, so it turns out, so you may have heard the story about the probation uh, restrictions. So it turns out he had some, what had happened is he had been involved, I think, in some computerized fraud scheme. And he was in prison for some years. And then he was let out, I can't be quite on parole, because there's no federal parole or such. He was let out early, maybe because of good behavior credits or whatever else. But he was then essentially on probation. You, you, you right? the supervised release, isn't it? Yeah, so, but I don't think it was standard probation. Somehow, in any case, let's just assume it's supervised release, just standard probation. Um, so there was one condition is that he can't access the internet. Another condition is he can't use aliases. So here's this guy who has this probation condition. He posts stuff on the internet using aliases, and using aliases in a way that is, doesn't defraud people out of money, but certainly puts the actors in a difficult spot. Also, if you recall, he originally said there are 100 Israeli Jews who are funding it. So, so on the one hand, people say, and I, there's something to this, well, look, if it wasn't so incendiary, nobody would go after him. On the other hand, federal prosecutors aren't exactly notorious softies on people who violate probation conditions. So, if, so when people say, well, they wouldn't have gone after him, I scratch my head and say, well, I imagine some federal prosecutors I know. Let's say somebody called up and said, there's this guy who has, who's posting this video of kittens but it's in violation of his probation condition, and he's doing it under an alias in ways that, I don't know, deceive the ASPCA or something, something comparably fraudulent and possibly a dangerous way. Would the prosecutor say, eh, who cares? Those are just, those aren't really important probation restrictions. Cut the guy some slack. Or would the prosecutor say, hey, we let him out early on condition that he not do something. He broke the rules that we imposed on him. We like enforcing rules. Not only did he break the rules, he broke the rules in actually a way that jeopardized somebody. Not, not just offended people, but jeopardized somebody. And what's more, the rules had to do with not cheating, and he's a convicted cheater, and it looks like he was cheating people. Yeah, I figure a prosecutor would probably try to send him back to jail for a year. The problem is it comes across to the rest of the world without this nuance. So when I understand that, I think that's a serious concern. On the other hand, you don't want a prosecutor to say, we're going to send this guy back to jail because we want to pacify the rest of the world. On the other hand, you don't want the prosecutor to say, well, we would normally send him back to jail, but this time we won't send him back to jail because we want to show the rest of the world we won't be pushed around. You know, I understand the desire to have prosecutors say that, but again, that's not the way prosecutors normally function. They say, look, if we think he ought to go to jail, we're not going to stay our hand in order to uh, uh, thumb our nose at the rest of the world. That's not normal prosecutor behavior. So it's hard to tell. Maybe this was an edict from on high and nobody would have gone after him. And maybe it was the sort of thing where prosecutors like to throw the book at, at probation violators. That's what they do. That's the kind of people they are. Well, let, me, right let, me give you, let me give you an example. Yeah. I don't know anything about this case, but I, I did have a case uh, some years back where a guy um, pled guilty to child pornography. And one of the, he served his time, 
And one of the conditions of his release, of supervised release, was that he could not have an internet connection without um, uh, getting the permission of his probation officer. So one day I get a petition from the government to have him arrested and put him back in the slammer because he had a home inspection and they discovered an internet connection. So I issued a warrant and they went out and arrested him and brought him into court and the guy's standing there in handcuffs um, and um, so I said, so what, what happened? And the probation officer says, we went by and we noticed that he had a PlayStation. He had a television set, he had a PlayStation, he had an Xbox. And we know that PlayStations and Xbox are often connected to the internet. And the guy said, it was just a PlayStation and an Xbox. There was no internet connection. I said, if you're lying to me, I'm going to send somebody out. I'm going to throw you in the slammer. He says, no, I'm not lying to you. There was no internet connection. It was just an Xbox and a PlayStation. So the idea that they take this kind of thing very seriously, particularly as to people, and I realize uh, internet fraud and child pornography are somewhat different, but the idea that they take very seriously violation of conditions uh, that, that involve uh, for, for people who, who, who mess up involving uh, uh, computers and, uh, and, and the like, uh, that they take those conditions very seriously is, is, is not a joke. This is, the experience tells us that they are very hard on anybody.